Welcome everyone. Uh, kia ora, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, every, everyone, depending on uh, where you are. Uh, welcome to the Dynamo User Group New Zealand. Uh, please let me introduce myself. Um, I, my name is Amadeo Papi. I'm the uh, Beam and Digital Solutions Lead uh, for Property and Buildings at GHD New Zealand and GHD Wooded Creative Spaces. And I will be the host of uh, this event. Uh, please note that the event will be uh, recorded and published on the uh, Dynamo User Group New Zealand YouTube channel. And please note that uh, the use um, of um, any uh, information provided in this presentation is at your own risk. Uh, we will have a QA session at the end of the presentation. And uh, so please write your questions in the QA panel uh, or in the in the chat. Uh, and and uh, please let's keep it interactive. <laughs> uh, OK, before we start, um, please let me introduce our group. Um, the Dynamo User Group New Zealand was founded in uh, uh, mid-2018 uh, by people coming from uh, various uh, architecture, engineering, construction organizations. Uh, currently, we have uh, six organizers here. Uh, we held B-monthly meetings. Uh, as you know, we publish our events on Eventbrite. Uh, depending on the event and, out, uh, and on the circumstances, we can uh, both uh, host uh, in presence uh, and or online. Uh, the attendance is always free, but uh, as we keep on saying, <laughs> the registration on Eventbrite is essential. Uh, our online events are recorded and are available on our uh, YouTube channel. We have more than uh, 200 subscribers uh, from all around the world. Uh, please subscribe to be notified when other events are published. As of today, our LinkedIn group counts around uh, almost 300 actually we are 298 members <laughs> we have uh, we had almost uh, 100 registrations for today's event and for all, uh, all our new friends please join and stay in touch today we asked Sola more for a presentation on dynamo optimization and future developments uh, it will present not just one but three priceless, I would say, insights on Dynamo, starting from uh, how to optimize Dynamo today and going through uh, its visual refresh and modernization to conclude with uh, what Autodesk is working on for future releases, uh, thus providing uh, a fundamental information for strategic development. Before introducing our speaker, uh, please let me thank our uh, virtual venue sponsor, uh, that is GHD, providing access to, uh, to the platform. So Sol uh, has experience uh, in a diverse range of fields, uh, ranging from construction through landscaping, industrial design and architecture, and now software development. Uh, he has focused his career on education and a technical understanding of complex problems, uh, tempered by carefully considered holistic design. Most of his career has been set within multidisciplinary firms working on large scale commercial projects um, where his focus has been upon communication, clarity and effect effectiveness between all parties involved, all while delivering outstanding bespoke design solutions. In our work at Autodesk as the product manager of Dynamo, responsible for the strategy, vision, direction and growth of Dynamo moving forward. Uh, his aptitude has led him down a more technical path where the use of coding, visual scripting, computation and agile methodologies have allowed him to work smarter, not harder. His ethos is that we should leverage the computational power available to us to automate many of the backend processes and the modern uh, world demands in order to allow us to get back to what we all really want to do, spend more time on the human components of building making to consider, to think, to play, to feel, and to bring design back to the forefront, allowing us to beautifully and holistically enhance the built fabric of our world. So thank you all for joining us. I leave now the virtual floor to Sol. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. I have forgotten I wrote that uh, novel on my uh, my LinkedIn page, so I appreciate that. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sol. I, uh, I'm a Kiwi. 
currently residing in North America. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but I'm here to present today three different flavors of Dynamo. Uh, so it's not going to be quite in the same order you said, uh, Amadeo, but we're going to do visual refresh and modernization and talk about that story first. Then what's coming down the pipes of Dynamo in the middle before we talk about what you can actually use today to, to make Dynamo sing, uh, to optimize it, uh, the settings you can affect. So that is, in essence, today's agenda. Uh, there's going to be a bit of a wrap up at the tail end, and I would encourage you all to please uh, speak up, raise your hand, uh, sing out and ask questions through here. I like being interrupted. I think it's more fun when it's a conversation as opposed to a presentation. Um, and then Amadeo, I can't see the chat window while I'm presenting, so if you can just call out any chat uh, in the window, that would be awesome. Thank you. So we're going to spend probably about an hour, just over an hour, talking about stuff. Uh, it would be awesome to risk my voice for a hot second if you have questions, so do please pipe up if you do. Uh, so I had a, a slide to say who I am, um, but thank you, Amadeo, for the introduction. I don't think I need to really cover this anymore. Uh, just a, a very brief point. Uh, I have lived now, I think, in five countries. So I started in New Zealand, born there, studied, moved to Scotland, then England, then Canada, now based in the US. So making my way around the English speaking world and then hopefully getting somewhere exotic after that. We'll see. We'll see what the world holds uh, post pandemic. And looking forward to getting home one day now that all the borders are back open. So there's something I wanted to start with, and this is this was not quite part of the agenda, but I think it's really important. And so this is starting to talk a little bit about like how Dynamo is built, just to give you a conception or an understanding of, of what it means when you see uh, those numbers on the right hand side of the screen. So if you open up Dynamo and you see in the about box like Dynamo Core and a bunch of different versions and Dynamo Revit and a bunch of different versions, I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about what this actually means. So in Dynamo, we adhere to this notion uh, called semantic versioning, uh, and this is our commitment. Uh, we try to adhere 100% to this, but sometimes it becomes difficult to uh, technically adhere to this. So in the spirit of semantic versioning, we, we typically adhere. Uh, so technically, there's some uh, API breaks in the back end that only one or two people in the whole world might be affected by, and we, we make sort of conscious choices on whether or not we make those changes. Uh, typically, with Dynamo, you get a bunch of different numbers, and this is referring to essentially versions. So uh, the yellow number, which is the first one, is the, is the major version. And this is what we typically try to avoid making any kind of breaking changes. So we, we call out API changes here, but that specifically means like we don't want your experience to change too much within these versions. So you should be able to open any single version of, of a graph inside of the major version and have it still work. To, to some degree, it's not backwards compatible, so to speak, um, but we'll get to that in a second. Now we then have minor versions. So this is adding functionality uh, that is backwards compatible in the sense that you can open that graph, it's not going to break. Uh, but if you open it with a node from the future version to an older version, that node's not going to exist in that earlier version. Uh, and then we have what's called a build or a patch version. And this is around uh, bug fixes predominantly. If we release a version of Dynamo, say 2.15, which we just released, and there's something major that's broken that we only find out after somebody uh, in a particular scenario finds it out of the world, uh, we will release a minor version here. So that would be 2.15.1 in this case. We try to wrap in as many bug fixes as we can to that, uh, in particular, the one that is usually really, really important, like crash bugs and things that, uh, do damage to your machine. Now, so we try to avoid those. We do a whole bunch of different testing inside of the team, but uh, if they do sneak through, we try to address those pretty quick. And then the last series of different numbers is essentially just a revision uh, version, which, which doesn't really mean anything. It's just for the, the team for us to understand build versions. So that number is just going to increment up. Uh, that number is going to be higher if we've done more iterations on a particular release and smaller if we haven't. So this is this notion of semantic versioning, which is we try to adhere to these different numbers. Uh, in, this, in this particular way so that you can have a degree of uh, confidence in Dynamo and how it operates. So to get a little bit deeper, there's uh, some heavy parts and some not so heavy parts. Now you can think of uh, like Revit releases as major versions. So, you know, you can't open a 2021 Revit model and a 2020 version of Revit. Um, similarly, you can't open a Dynamo 2.x uh, graph in a Dynamo 1.x world uh, because there's some major breaking changes that exist. So in the case of 2.x to 1.x, we actually changed the way the Dynamo file itself is written. So it, Older versions literally cannot understand newer versions. If you don't open a older version and a newer version, then it's going to have an upgrade or a migration process uh, with that. So they're not backwards compatible between major versions. That's the unhappy path. Uh, but anything within the minor versions of, of this uh, is a happy path. So 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, anything in the 2.x world is still going to be able to open inside of that world, which is nice. 
So then we get to minor versions. Uh, this is typically where we add functionality that will not stop the graph being opened in a prior version. It may not exist because if this functionality, for example, a new node was released in say Dynamo 2.6, if you try to open that in Dynamo 2.5, uh, that node is not going to be there. This is not actually part of the code base. So you're going to get a, a sort of a warning in a dummy node scenario and you can work around that uh, by changing that, that graph, but that exact graph is not going to work the way it was authored in a future version. Uh, so one example of this is TuneUp, which is an extension that we use to give you runtimes on nodes and overall graphs. Uh, that has particular like uh, technology and Dynamo APIs that need it, need to exist for it to actually do anything, and that only exists after Dynamo 2.5. So even though that's a package available on the package manager, there is a giant warning label associated with that package to say this is only going to work after Dynamo 2.5, and those APIs exist. Uh, so all of the all the graphs will still execute in previous versions, minor those uh, future things that are not backwards portable, uh, and they refer to as dummy nodes. Then we get down to sort of the build patch version stuff. Uh, this typically only goes out, like I said, to address breaking crash or bug fixes. Uh, usually quality of life stuff. Like we want, there's not going to be any feature changes that come in one of these versions, so you're not going to get anything new. What you're going to get is stability improvements, performance improvements, and bug fixes, uh, and that's. It, there's a cost associated with, with uh, making release for us. So we try to only do these when they're absolutely necessary. So very minor bugs are still going to wait till a, a future version. And graphs in uh, this sort of version number are going to function 100% identically from a feature perspective across all of these patch releases. So that gets us to sort of Dynamo Core versus Dynamo for any given host. So as you'll note that Revit is not civil 3D, is not advanced, uh, sorry, it's not alias or advanced steel or robot structural analysis or any of our other hosts that we have. Uh, and Dynamo Core provides this core common experience for everybody. Uh, this means uh, you will get the same core experience in all of our hosts, and, and you can also get this expressed as Dynamo Sandbox, uh, which is like a developer playground where you can use Dynamo by itself. Uh, but when you use it by itself, you can't use any of the other host functionality unless it's an out of process API and it gets a little bit funky. So Dynamo is expressed in many different hosts. And as I just mentioned, the host content is only available in that host unless you play some interesting games. I'm trying to resolve that as time goes on, but that's the way it is today. So just some very quick practices before we jump into the three primary topics of today's talk. Uh, in terms of major versions, try to use the same major version uh, as, as if you can across your entire office. Um, obviously, if you have projects that are spanning multiple years, this may be difficult, but where possible, try to stick to the same major version so you can use those graphs uh, across different uh, Revit versions, uh, different simple 3D versions, uh, and different Dynamo versions. Uh, we'd also recommend you carefully manage your package contents. And so use a version that's compatible for all users where possible, or you have a package for each version of Dynamo. Uh, two different approaches, both requiring slightly different management techniques. Uh, another way to approach this, uh, and another recommendation we have, is to stick to the lowest common denominator if you can. Uh, this means that if you build all your graphs in the lowest version that your office is using, they will definitely work in every single version of Dynamo. Uh, so that's another way to sort of get around the, the problem space that exists with having lots of awesome new features in future versions, but people stuck in older versions are not really able to access them. Uh, and then in terms of managing graph versions, uh, another really useful technique is to create backups of your graphs and version specific graphs uh, sh should you need. Uh, and that means simply it's the same as anything. I remember being in university, you know, you work for five hours on something, you forget to save, but it destroys itself. So having a backup on that scenario is usually very helpful. So that's just a quick introduction to uh, Dynamo sort of semantic versioning and how we want to, to handle or well, we, how we do handle uh, building Dynamo. So I'll pause for a hot second if there's any questions on that stuff. Otherwise, we have the three topics that Amadeo said at hand to talk about and get into some funky visuals. All right, if you do have any questions, please do sing out. Again, I would encourage you to, to interrupt me. It doesn't hurt my flow, I'm used to it, and I actually prefer it than just sitting here and monologuing for an hour or so. So what we're gonna talk about now is uh, exploring the new Dynamo, or Dynamo's visual refresh, as we like to call it, and uh, modernization. So we have had a concerted effort on trying to make Dynamo easier for people to use. Uh, so what we wanted to do was refresh the visual design uh, and also the paradigms that, that exist inside of Dynamo so that 
all of you guys can have a much better understanding of how Dynamo works, uh, sort of surfacing all of the hidden things, honing the rough edges, uh, removing the magic stuff that just happened in the background and didn't tell you anything or what was going on, uh, and really lowering the barrier to entry. What we're trying to do is make Dynamo much easier for everybody to use so more and more people can find success with Dynamo. And when you build a graph, you can give it to somebody else and you can get them up to speed faster. So we wanted everybody to have access to a modern, considered, sleek and cohesive experience. So not only is this a visual refresh to make everything uh, look a little bit more modern, it surfaces information, it uh, reimagines the experience of Dynamo, uh, empowering uh, retention and, and reducing fall off for people who might uh, find it a little bit difficult in the historical versions, but also predominantly about putting information at your fingertips. We want you to know everything you need to know when you start using Dynamo. So we're giving a lot more information in Dynamo. So you can find more success with it. We're trying to really foster a more effective and insightful graph authoring experience. We just really want you to find uh, more success and have more fun doing what you're doing. Uh, so that is like setting the tone for the Dynamo Visual Refresh modernization effort. And now we're gonna go through a series of different slides to explain some of the major features that have happened uh, across Dynamo versions 2.12, 2.13, 2.14 and 2.15. So this is sort of all encompassing. Uh, we've had the predominant work dropped in 2.13, which was our global launch release for Revit 2023 and other hosts. Uh, and then we have had some residual uh, pieces of that puzzle coming through in the latter two versions as well. So without further ado, uh, we have introduced this thing called a preferences panel. Uh, so this was actually introduced in Dynamo 2.12, and this is like your one-stop shop to customize your user experience, your experience of Dynamo. And so the old settings menu inside of Dynamo uh, has predominantly been ported here, as have a bunch of other things. And the reason we did this was for scalability, as well as being like a one-stop shop. So previously we had uh, a bunch of different things starting to show up in the drop-down menus uh, from Dynamo that were maybe not quite in the right place, and that was going to start to not really scale well, which means we couldn't keep adding stuff to the existing menus and we couldn't keep adding menus uh, across the board because it would have got really messy and started to become really confusing. So the preferences panel enables us to have a more concerted place uh, to put all of this information. So this is expressed under a new menu item uh, and that is under the Dynamo menu, which now has, holds the About, Exit Dynamo and Preferences panel. Uh, it's a new dialogue, contains all the preferences. You have a bunch of different uh, sub panels uh, from the overall preferences panel and they give you things like general features, uh, visual settings, uh, package manager experience and so on. I'm going to talk a little bit about the expression of some of these things later on, but in essence, it's a one stop shop. All of the settings are expressed as uh, options here for you to select. It's going to give you a very clear visual understanding of how your Dynamo experience has been customized. Uh, and one thing to note is that all settings do automatically save uh, when you make a change to those settings, uh, rather than having to sort of commit those settings at the exit of the dialogue. Uh, this is done because it gets really slow if you have a backlog of many different settings you've tried to change uh, with the preferences panel. So there's a quick little video showcasing what the preferences panel is. You'll notice it comes from a new menu. There's a bunch of different things in here, like expander panels. You'll notice most of the settings are what you're familiar with in Dynamo today. There's a few new ones as well, uh, some buttons to do some interesting things. Uh, but for the most part, this is where you need to go if you want to find any form of customization inside of your Dynamo experience. Uh, the package manager tab in particular, we're going to cover on its own dedicated slide because it introduces a few new features into the world of Dynamo, uh, beyond just being a, a translation of the existing package manager management system. So, can I butt in? So, a policy. Yeah, for sure. You and Jeff are consulting uh, in New Zealand, clearly. Um, good to yeah. see you again. <laughs> uh, really Likewise. quick question for you on that one. Um, with those Python settings that's bundled into the preferences manager now, uh, I mean, in the later versions, you've got a resetting of the C Python environment. Is there scope there right. to add in something so to make it a bit easier for users to add their own modules into Python through the preferences interface, as opposed to having manually load them into the um, Python site packages folders per your workflows on uh, GitHub? Yes, uh, sure answer. Not right now in Dynamo, but we want to get there. So we, we have an outstanding okay. task to, to essentially um, improve that system. We, we had sort of two different options. One of them was bundle like the 10 most popular packages out of the box with Dynamo. So that gives you a similar kind of experience to uh, using the built-in libraries in Iron Python. 
Uh, so you'd just be able to use them. Anybody could build a package that refers to them. Everybody will have them. It gives consistency, and that's probably the path we're going to take. Uh, the, the harder path, but the more expressive path, would be to enable you to install any kind of Python package in, into your world. Um, we could do that too, but uh, it requires a lot more effort, and it comes at the cost of doing other things. Um, so if you're familiar, there is a post on the forum that is uh, – I can't remember who authored the post originally, but in essence, a way to use Python and Dynamo to install Python and Dynamo. So it gets a little bit meta, um, but you can install packages just by entering on their string name uh, using that that world. And I could find a link if, if you want to find it too. Well, you might be looking familiar forward to the uh, looking forward to the survey showing up on the forum to pick the ten most used packages. Then, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's just going to be I don't know the wild west. Maybe we'll see. Uh, awesome. But yeah, so short answer is like the the Python experience. Like, there's room for us to improve for sure. It's it's still pretty simplistic in in terms. It's not really a, a pure ID, uh, IDE. But the reset C Python node in particular is like if the the machine gets into a weird state, you can essentially flush it and start again. So that button should be quite helpful if you're working in C Python. Any other questions uh, before we move on? All right, so uh, where we go beyond this is into sort of like the, the bulk of what looks different. And so we redesigned and refreshed the user interface. Uh, and this has, like, is set with uh, some internal guidelines at Autodesk, uh, we call it the HAG, which is like human interface guidelines. It's used that as a base position. This means that things like contrast are taken into consideration quite seriously, uh, understanding how to surface information and so on. So what we wanted to do is just modernize the, the look and feel of Dynamo to reimagine and evolve the user interaction. Uh, we wanted to put all information at your fingertips on nodes. We wanted to explain features better. We wanted to surface hidden behavior and show things like node states in a much better way. Uh, there's also a bunch of new features, and we're going to cover some of those more in depth as well. So you'll notice that everything looks a little bit different. It's now kind of dark themed. There's a new tabular experience. There's a cleaner way to export stuff. Uh, we've updated the UI, there's a modern node styling, a bunch of different things, so restyled run modes and so on. So also some really cool stuff that's come out in 2.14 and 2.15 too, if you've started playing with that world. The library looks different. Essentially, almost everything looks different. And by the time we're done uh, with refreshing the, the style of everything, it is all going to look different. Um, this is the bulk of what the, the restyling effort will be though. So to get a little bit more granular into some of the stuff, we wanted to redesign uh, everything to give you more information. Uh, the nodes being a huge portion of that. And nodes are extremely complex from a code perspective inside of Dynamo. You know, you touch a node, it comes touches everything in the code base. So there is a huge amount of effort that's gone into making uh, the back end of, of these nodes actually hook up to itself, not just making it look a little different. So you'll notice there's uh, some long requested outstanding things that have cropped up in here, which is kind of fun, like uh, node icons now showing in the header bar. We have a restyled node in the dark theme. This is focusing on contrast and clarity, uh, restyled context menus, restyled preview bubbles, uh, restyled everything in essence. Um, what we've done is introduced a feature that's around like port satisfaction. So an unsatisfied port, which means a port that does require something to be plugged into it, but doesn't currently have, have something plugged into it, has now got a red bar on it, a sort of vertical red bar. And when that port is satisfied, it has a vertical blue bar. So when you're working through and building your graph uh, and plugging things in or unplugging, uh, it's going to be dynamic and show you in that moment whether or not that node requires uh, those, these ports to be fulfilled to purely also execute correctly. Uh, and then the default port uh, is now more graphically obvious, and it has a second vertical blue bar sitting outside the nodal space. And this is uh, uh, to show you that you don't need to plug something into these particular ports, but also to tell you that if you have something plugged into this port, you can unplug it and it will still execute given it has a default. So everything here is uh, like fresher in terms of information. You'll notice that there's the three dot menu icon for the context menu. This means that you can still right click on the node to get access to that, but previously that was kind of hidden behavior. You kind of had to figure it out, follow the primer, ask somebody, or simply right click on stuff to find it. That is now also accessible through left click, which means it's also accessible using uh, other sort of ways to enter Dynamo, and that's important for the future. So then uh, we also wanted to surface information on the node clearly in with more granular control. Um, so there's a, a bunch of different things we've done on this front. So we have this notion of alerts inside of Dynamo, 
uh, this is like warnings and errors and stuff as the, the bubble above a node. Uh, we now have those being able to stack should there be a situation where they can stack. And this has a hierarchical error, uh, so hierarchy of error over warning over information, and information is a new state we've added to. Uh, you have the ability to dismiss warnings inside of Dynamo right now. Currently, that's only in session, uh, but in the future, we're planning to reimagine that and have that serializable, which means uh, savable, that state of, of a dismissed warning into the graph. Uh, so you can run it through things like Dynamo Player and have a designed in experience that understands there may be a warning, but you know, um, you know that it's going to occur and you've designed how to deal with it later downstream inside of your nodes. Uh, in terms of renaming the nodes, this has gone away from being a sort of giant in your face yellow renamed tag to a rather subtle blue uh, dot uh, and much love from John Pearson on this one. He was uh, not a fan of the red, uh, the orange rename nodes. Uh, we've also introduced a, a preview uh, state showcasing as a eye, uh, eye icon. We've also showcased a sort of status bar at the bottom of the node, which is an, uh, yellow for warning and red for orange or blue for information. Uh, this is sort of like the zoomed in version of, of how to experience this. And we've actually introduced this thing called zoom states, which we'll cover later, that shows you the zoomed out experience. And we've also introduced some uh, actions you can take on wires, which are predominantly gonna be covered in the next slide, but you can also, also right click on the output port of nodes to deal with breaking connections or hiding wires as well. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any point, anyone, if you guys have any questions on this stuff, otherwise I'll just keep, keep going on. All right, so we also wanted to improve groups and make them much more powerful. And so we have this notion of uh, parent groups and child groups. And so you have the ability to have a group within a group now, moving forward, uh, a child group. And you can have any number of child or children groups inside of that parent group, but you can only go one layer deep. Uh, we could improve this in the future if we wanted to, but there are some performance concerns when you get too much of this going on. So we kept it at one right now. Uh, we have also introduced a sort of header bar to the groups, which have both the group title and the group description, which is new, and the ability to collapse these groups. So you see the child group here in blue has actually been collapsed and it's showcasing a slightly different behavior than what you might have seen with the parent group. This means that you can have a what we call proxy ports that are built onto the input and output of this group. This means that any nodes that are inside that have a port uh, that is unsatisfied or sorry, satisfied or needing to be satisfied is going to surface there. And then it's going to give you a count as well to tell you what kind of content is in there. And we foresee collapsed groups being either in a parent or by themselves as being a way to sort of hide away behavior that the user doesn't really need to know, but is important to making your graph work. So you can use this feature to really improve the way that Dynamo uh, is uh, entered into by other people who didn't author the graph, and maybe yourself in the future too, uh, to be able to uh, only see the relevant information at the right point in time. So you can think of these uh, collapsed groups or these uh, as Kind of like giant nodes they surface the ports and they kind of behave in essence like an improved custom node you also have the ability to drag and drop nodes and uh, groups and notes into a group simply by hovering over that group it'll get a gray outline and you can just drag that in it's a really nice experience uh, after 213 john pearson actually added a pr to do the same thing to remove it using the uh, alt key so you can drag things out of a group in that way too uh, everything's been also uh, restyled to make to look different and uh, in later versions, which we'll get to in a second, we're introducing a notion of group styles, which enables you to customize even further. So the restyled group menu or context menu is again in the same theme and stylistically consistent with the rest of the visual refresh. I'll pause there for a second. Uh, any questions on either the node stuff, the general stuff or the group stuff? Moving on, uh, we have also introduced a bunch of graph authoring tools. So this is around uh, the ability to do some really cool things with notes and wires. So first one is we've introduced the ability to pin notes to nodes so that they can move in unison. This means uh, if you select both a note and a node, right click and go pin to node. In the future, we're going to add the drag and drop feature. Uh, we haven't quite got there yet. Uh, it means that they're going to move in unison, like I said, which is really cool for the ability to sort of like have them tethered. Previously, you kind of had to just have them close to each other and remember to select and move those. Uh, they're in essence going to behave like one thing. 
We've also introduced the ability to pin uh, wires. So there's a right-click option, or there's two options on the wire. Actually, there's a hover interaction. So if you hover over a wire, uh, there's a slight delay. It's going to give you the option to either introduce a watch node or a pin, and you'll see that in the sort of lower left uh, text. And that means you can then go and pin the wire, which behaves kind of like if you'd had like a dummy, a co-block with just a, an X in it or something and previously. You can just control how your wires look. It also works with the line tools and works and behaves how you would expect. Uh, introducing a watch node into this world means that it's going to put a watch node in between the two nodes that the, that the wire is connected to. And, you know, going undo or redo is going to, to play nicely in that world too. Uh, that is kind of like the more verbose way to explore your data. You can also, when you hover over a wire, see sort of a, a data preview of what is inside the wire. So you'll notice that there is like, it tells you what node it's coming from, it tells you what node it is going to, and then a little preview of the data. And the caveat here is that it doesn't show you nested information. It just shows you sort of top level information. So those are kind of like the hover interactions on wires. And then we have the right click options. So you get the ability to right click on a wire and now break the connection, which essentially just destroys that wire. Uh, you get the ability to select connected, which selects both of the nodes on either end sort of works hand in hand with the ability if you select a node and do a uh, shift tab uh, or tab it's going to sort of expand out and extend back on your selection gives you a sort of a way to navigate those really big graphs that you might not know what that wire is doing and, and how to sort of navigate around because you can use zoom to fit things too which is pretty cool and then the last one is introducing the ability to hide a wire uh, and so on the right hand side there is the expression of what a hidden wire looks like when the node is selected uh, when it's not selected, it's completely hidden. You can't see it whatsoever. Uh, and this is thought to be useful for those giant graphs. We have wires that are sort of going over uh, an entire swathe of nodes and kind of just causing a little bit of uh, visual clutter and confusion. You get the ability now to hide that should you wish. This is also potentially useful for having, say, a watch node for the results of your graph right back up at the front of your graph where you have, say, input sliders. And you want to change some of the variables and, and see what the results are right there without it being a little bit messy. Now you can also use the, the pins to sort of clean up the graph space as well if you want to keep those wires rather than hiding them. Any questions? Should I keep going on? Um, quick question from me, Sol. Um, sure. With those pinning of the wires for the large graphs that do exist and have seen throughout the years um, make a huge difference to the readability of the graphs. Is there like a bulk wire selection tool with a kind of a, a, a similar function that uh, cleanup node layout would uh, would do for the wires themselves? You know, like organizing the server cables in a beautiful way. <laughs> right, yeah, I get you. Um, so the first of all, pins do work with the cleanup node layout. Uh, they are kind of treated in a very similar way to what a node is. So they work with all of the align tools and so on, uh, and they will uh, generally behave well as one or two edge cases. Um, we don't currently have a feature that does sort of like the, the beautify your wires, if you will, um, but that's something we can definitely think about for the future. The tricky thing is trying to figure out the algorithm that's going to beautify them in a correct way. True. So if you've got any, if you've got any thoughts on that one, so send them my way. I'll do. Cool. Anyone else have any questions so far on what we've seen? There is a bunch more stuff to come. All right. So we've also experienced, oh, sorry, improved the experience of the uh, package consumption experience is when you download a package. This has now been split into sort of uh, two different uh, pieces, if you will. So we have the download sort of quick hit experience, which gives you all of the information uh, that you want to see in the current uncollapsed version of Dynamo. Uh, this has been restyled, has given you uh, all of the existing information in terms of things like package, host name, dependencies, authors, whether or not it's been updated recently, and so on. And then there's this little uh, button that says View Details, and that takes you to the right-hand side, which is a new View Details extension that gives you sort of the verbose or expanded information for the packages themselves. Uh, the cool thing about this is not only does it surface all the information in a more legible format than uh, it did previously, it gives you all of the previous versions of uh, of that package and the ability to install them from there too, uh, as well as understand all of their host requirements, Python requirements, package requirements, and, and later versions. Also, information around repository links, uh, whether or not it has copyright data associated to it, and so on. 
Uh, all of the information at the top has been oriented to be in a sort of compacted set, so you get to see like the voting on it, the, the download count, the last updated date, uh, the author, and so on. Uh, and all of the other information you need is really there at your fingertips. So this is for whether or not you want to go and explore packages, whereas the quick hit experience is more, you know the one you want to download and you're just going to go and download the latest version. So along with, uh, along with that, we've done a package consumption, uh, so authoring experience, which comes later, um, but workspace references, which works with packages, has also been improved. So workspace references, uh, for those unaware, is an extension that if you're missing content, uh, so, so in this case packages, uh, from your graph, and you open that graph, it's going to tell you. It's going to tell you what you're missing and give you the option to install it. So that functionality has been in Dynamo now for numerous different versions, and we've gone and updated that in 2013. So this has uh, improved uh, the visually the, that existing reference uh, extension and also added in what we call local definitions and external files. So local definitions are local packages, if you will, so custom nodes, uh, local DLLs, and so on. Uh, and then external files are things like JPEG images, Excel documents, and so on. And all of this is really just a read-only right now. It just tells you what is there, but it tells you what you need to ship with your graph or have the person who's using your graph have access to for it to work in the same way that you experience it. Uh, it's a bunch of different information. Uh, you'll notice there's a recurring theme. I haven't touched upon it so much yet, but there's these little eyes or question marks all over the show. And there's a lot of different hover help information that's been added to Dynamo to try and help you navigate this world. And this is part of that notion of sort of putting information at your fingertips when you need it. Uh, also gives you uh, notions of host requirements inside of the external files too. So the packages will help you actively do things like install packages and local definitions and external files will give you the information you need to make a con uh, sort of informed decision to be able to send that on to somebody else. And going a little deeper into packages, uh, package experience has been improved as well. Uh, not so much on the UI front. There's a lot of backend work that's gone into this. So package manager previously had a managed packages uh, under the packages uh, header at the top of Dynamo. Uh, this is now in the preferences panel, and it gives you the ability to understand states. So uh, in the node and package path, you get a couple of different pathing options and the ability to do things like uh, disable loading of built-in packages or disable loading of custom packages if you want to sort of in mass brute force stop that stuff. Uh, and then also gives you the ability to have your standard pathing things, but the install packages is where the interesting uh, thing comes in. So states are all going to be shown here via filters. So depending on the packages you have and the states that they're in, it's going to tell you whether or not those uh, packages are scheduled for deletion, uh, scheduled for install, uh, whether or not they're in error state or whether or not they're in a loaded state. Uh, and that's really cool because it can start to tell you why those things are happening and give you more information to try and resolve and help uh, your packages out. Uh, previously, a lot of that was sort of hidden, a little bit of magic in the back end, and it didn't really uh, give you the tools you needed to start making an informed decision on how to resolve conflicts. Uh, so each, uh, each tag also has this hover that tells you exactly what it means when it says it's in one of these particular states. On top of that, uh, we've gone and improved uh, the group experience by adding in this thing called group styles. Uh, this means you're going to have the ability to sort of name a style and preset it with a color. Uh, in the short term, color is all we have exposed so far, uh, but this gives you access to literally any color you wish in the entire world. So no longer are you limited to only the sort of 16 odd different colors we have out of the box, uh, which is still accessible here if you like them. And uh, you now have the ability to use these group styles and add any kind of color you wish. It's going to give you a default one when, it, when it's created, but you get to go into the color picker tool and essentially change that to anything you wish. So this means you can have customization for your own offices or your own personal tastes. Uh, there's these four default styles, which gives a degree of consistency across the world of Dynamo in general. We've called these actions, inputs, outputs, and review. Uh, and this is something you can use by default unless you want to choose your own and then the world is your oyster, go nuts. So we've also uh, done some small things like increase the connector dot size for more clarity, uh, given the ability to apply these styles to the groups in the context menu of groups, and updated some of our different uh, dialogues which were missed in the previous version. So this is now into some 2.14 stuff. Another really cool thing we've done, and what I think is really cool, hopefully you think is the same, as we've introduced a Dynamo Dictionary out of the box inside of Dynamo itself. So Dynamo Dictionary is an external website that we've historically had that takes every single node uh, and gives you a little sample graph and an example file of what that node is, as well as an in-depth description. Uh, so that gives you essentially more information 
into uh, into Dynamo, into that node, and how to use it. So some of the sort of more esoteric nodes that may be uh, you know, not as easy to understand, although we've done some improvement on, on naming and descriptions recently, uh, should be a lot more useful now. So we built a tool to essentially pull down all that information from the website. Uh, it would tell us, uh, we'll try and auto-create as in essence these MD files or markdown files that is going to be inside of the Dynamo experience. If they did not exist, so it's because there were some nodes that were introduced to Dynamo, but not introduced to the, the Dynamo dictionary, uh, it would just create a stub and we had to fill those in. But that is now done. Every single core node is out of the box inside of Dynamo from 2.15 onwards. And we're looking to do the same thing for Revit and uh, host, uh, other hosts moving to the future too. So this is automatically going to show up inside of Dynamo. Uh, in Dynamo 2.15 and onwards, you just use the F1 hotkey for help on any node. It'll bring it up. Uh, previous to that, you right click on the node and you select help. It's going to give you all of that information. So the, the one caveat here is that uh, sample image, you kind of have to drag the uh, documentation browser out to be to see it. We've got some work to do to make that a more lovable experience. Any questions on the stuff? Oh, just a bit of feedback. So I'll have shown that feature to um, a couple of the cadets here. And they absolutely love the fact that all the information to do with what that node is expecting of what it is doing, because they're only dealing with the out of the box stuff, um, is right at their fingertips now. And that's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that, Ewan. It's, um, you know, we, we think so too. We thought it was uh, a big hole previously in Dynamo and wanted to make sure it was a, a more lovable experience to be able to work in Dynamo and sort of get that information where you think it should be, as opposed to have to go outside to an external source and find it. And uh, do appreciate that feedback. Any other feedback, please send it my way. Uh, it makes the team feel very happy. Um, I'm usually the interface to them for, for feedback and they like to know what you guys are getting up to with Dynamo. Uh, so here, just one, uh, one comment more than a question. I think that sure. what you're showing here is uh, a lot of work behind the scenes. It's a, it's a rework of, uh, of the UI uh, and uh, for a visual programming tool, it, you know, how it looks. Is really important, so because it makes you know the clarity, it makes uh, things uh, more understandable. It, it makes things faster, you know, to modify, to update. So um, you know, uh, in typical programming languages, you know, you are more focused on features or new, you know, libraries or new uh, methods or whatever you you, you know. Uh, that basically, you know, the the, the core uh, of the programming language here. Here you have a, 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 an additional layer, you know, that is somehow uh, how things are uh, shown in the in the tool in Dynamo, because this also is part of your programming somehow experience and programming uh, um, environment. So it's really really yeah. important. Agreed, and thank you, Amadeo. Uh, so it's what we think too. It's uh, like a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, but we think like doing this is going to make the experience for everyone, not just beginners, but in particular beginners, but also advanced users, like a much more uh, successful, effective way to use Dynamo because it's just going to be there when you need it. Like even myself, we've been using Dynamo for a very long time uh, and working it day in and day out. Like there's certain things I don't know about how some nodes behave and function. And I also use this new feature to try and look at the dictionary content to figure out how they work. So I think it's really awesome and I do appreciate the feedback. It's um, It's really nice to hear. We, uh, we're really indexing or we're focusing on trying to make Dynamo more useful and more effective for when you use it. Uh, and all of the powerful stuff that you talk about uh, that comes in other languages is definitely in the pipes too. So I've got some good stuff coming. All right, now, so in Dynamo 2.15, uh, moving on, uh, we also added a feature called uh, Trusted Locations. And so this is uh, to caveat, we have not we're not aware as the Dynamo team of any malicious thing that has happened inside of the world of Dynamo. But uh, as soon as something malicious does happen, we wouldn't be able to move fast enough. And so what this does is takes a step in the right direction to give you power to control how you consume your Dynamo graphs. So in essence, when you open up Dynamo for the first time uh, in 215, on any graph, it's going to give you this pop up on the left hand side. And this starts to talk about this notion of trusting locations. So if you think about Windows, uh, Windows machine, you get certain uh, access rights or user rights that give you access to certain pieces of that machine. And there's baseline Windows uh, security. 
And so if you have user rights, you get to be able to do a bunch more things. If you've got admin rights, even more stuff to that machine. And if you don't have either of those rights, uh, then you're very limited in what you can do. So we sort of uh, sit on top of that experience and we lean into that and we use the notion of locations to trust where you consume a dynamograph. So if you open up a dynamograph, you get these three different options. In essence, the settings will take you to the preferences panel on the right hand side. Uh, no closes file, which will just completely shut down that dynamograph before it is ran uh, at all. And then yes, we'll be temporarily allowing you to uh, use that graph and not change the, the experience of having this pop up uh, unless you click that tick box, which trusts uh, that file's location in the future. So if you click on settings or if you click on yes, it's going to add a file path to the trusted locations. Uh, and this simply means that it's not going to pop up with these experiences. You uh, nominating that that is a trustworthy location uh, from where you want to work. So maybe uh, your desktop or downloads is not a trusted location, but uh, somewhere in your network drive or somewhere else in your documents file or somewhere else on your machines. Uh, if you don't like this experience, you get the ability to completely opt out of it using the disable trust warnings uh, button and that completely removes that functionality for you as a user. We would advocate that you do use it and you do start using trusted locations because it's uh, becoming increasingly important across any piece of software, not just Dynamo, uh, to be uh, working with security in mind uh, and it becomes, you know, more and more important as we live in an ever increasingly connected world. So you notice even things like Microsoft Outlook are starting to show, uh, you know, external sender information. This is kind of Dynamo's version of that. Uh, what it will do is also when you trust these locations, is also recursively trust any subfolders as well. So if you trust your C drive, you're in essence, then you might as well just disable the trust warning because you're trusting pretty much everything. Uh, if you want to trust certain locations that have a bunch of different subfolders in them, so this will do that for you. Uh, one other thing to note is we've, uh, and I'll show you in a second, uh, updated the run modes as well, uh, but the run mode will be blocked until you, you take action here. So no matter what happens, uh, while this dialogue is popped up, you will not be executing any dynamograph at all. And so this stops any potential malicious code that is embedded inside of that dynamograph or a package therein uh, from running, and you get the choice uh, to take action. So there's a little video on this one just to showcase how this works. You open up a graph and it gives you this sort of file trust uh, dialogue box in the lower right. Uh, and then you get to sort of take action. In this case, if you go no, close the file, it's just going to exit out of that file. Uh, if you click on uh, a different option, in this case, uh, yes, it's going to temporarily open that option. Uh, it's going to give you a little dialogue. Uh, it's not shown in this video, but a little toast notification in the upper right telling you what has happened. And if you click yes, and then you get the ability to trust this location in the future as well which again should have this uh, toast notification to tell you what you have trusted as a, a form of a feedback loop on that front. Pretty simple in concept. Uh, in essence, we're looking to get ahead of any potential future problems when it comes to uh, security and Dynamo, and we want to make sure that you have control uh, when you choose this stuff. So there is a security tab and you get to add, modify and remove these paths uh, and that API is secure as well. So nobody externally can make a change to that API. Cool, okay. So moving on, uh, well, any any questions on on file trust before I go any further? Um, it's a it's something that is somewhat sensitive to some some people, uh, you know, wanting to make sure that everything is secure. So happy to answer any questions. Again, just a comment. Very important feature, especially you know, in enterprise level. You know, it's it's fundamental. Uh, as you say, you know, uh, this is you are executing code, so you know. Uh, and and especially for our for a platform like Dynamo, you know, relying on uh, open source or you know or you know yeah. exchange of of you know graphs and so on. So it's important to have a, this additional level of protection and be sure that what you execute from you know um, is more trusted. That's that's really really important. So we think too. So. You know, we're hoping this uh, this uh, alleviates some concern in the world of Dynamo. And if you have any thoughts on, on how we you want to see this sort of evolve into the future, just let us know. Just a just a question on that. Jumping in, sorry, Anton from Warren and Marnie. Um, when you are scaling this across a practice, for example, and you want to have like this is our our library, uh, like how how do you imagine that working when you would want to propagate this to say two hundred people's machines to say access the library from this location? It's a, it's a good question. We're actually doing work uh, starting in about a month on deploying Dynamo settings, and we'll talk about that in the future setting uh, session. Well, Perfect. series of slides that are upcoming. Perfect. Is there another question? 
no, that was it for me. Thanks. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Any questions before we move on? Okay. So uh, in Dynamo 2.15, we're also dropping a brand new extension uh, that is kind of coupled into a footer and a graph manager, uh, which is going to give you a sort of higher level understanding of um, how to sort of navigate your graph and the states that things exist in. So starting with the footer on the lower left, uh, we've reimagined how the run messages are working. So in Dynamo previous to this, you'd only ever get like run completed or run completed with warnings, even if there were errors. So we're now being more expressive with what that means, meaning if you complete with errors, it's going to tell you that there's a hierarchy again that's common across everything with errors being dominant over warnings and being dominant over information states. We also are going to capture in a little counter next to the run uh, status uh, any amount of errors, warnings or information uh, states on your nodes and that is clickable. So if you click on that, it's going to zoom to those nodes in your graph and cycle through it as you keep clicking. So you can very quickly navigate to the problem space to get there really quick, uh, which we think is awesome. So that's like your, your quick hit uh, access point. And then the graph node ma uh, manager uh, extension is a way to sort of get more granular with that. So this is an extension that enables you to, first of all, search through the entire workspace. Uh, people have been asking for this for a very long time. This means you can search for any amount of nodes in your graph and it's going to curate the list of nodes uh, below it. Uh, so if you're searching for a particular renamed node, that's going to show up here as well. Uh, in this case, I have, oops, I broke it again, dot, dot, dot. Uh, you could search for that and it will bring you there really quickly. Uh, if you don't want to just search for the nodes, you can also use our sort of state filters and these are additive. So you can say, I want to find every node that is say in a frozen state or every node that is in a frozen state and it has the preview off and it's going to give you that curated list of nodes. Um, into that list of nodes themselves, if you select any node here, it's going to zoom to that node. So similar to the footer experience, it's going to zoom to that node. And if there's expanded information inside of those nodes, such as a warning, it's going to expand it and tell you what that is. So once you have the warning, you can see it right there rather than having to sort of navigate around your graph. If you have a graph that you inherited from someone else and has maybe lots of warnings in it. Uh, every single uh, node is going to have these different columns associated with it. So we have a type column, state column, issues column and outputs column. So type column is going to showcase things like function state, inputs, outputs. Uh, state column is going to showcase things like frozen state uh, or whether or not the node is in an information state. Uh, issues is going to showcase errors and warnings. Uh, and then our output state is going to showcase things like whether or not the output of those nodes contains an empty list or a null value. So not only is it showcasing states of nodes, it's showcasing potential uh, problems with the data that's flowing through the nodes as well. So it should be able to get you to the problem areas within your graph much, much faster. Uh, and it should be useful for every single user of Dino, but in particular, uh, those people who sort of have to fix other people's graphs uh, in their office and might not get given the, the context that they need. Uh, they should get you to the end result much faster. So we see this as a, as a huge way to sort of save time uh, and get you to resolving your graphs into a happy state really quickly, as well as just simply navigate through them and find what is going on. Uh, you also get the ability to copy to clipboard any of the extended data, so uh, warnings or uh, errors, but also the node path. So you'll notice if you're eagle-eyed, uh, the renamed node uh, here that I just renamed is called a geometry.point.create. So it tells you what that path is to again give you breadcrumbs into the world of design script. Uh, and then also there's an export feature that can export all of this information out to Excel or JSON file. Uh, we're going to make this into an API in the future as well. So firms that want to track uh, all of the states uh, at, at play, maybe build their own extension and uh, track information that is passing through the graph to see if there's any problems can start to leverage this too. So we're pretty excited about this one and, and can't wait to see how you use it. It's a little video uh, that is uh, showcasing here uh, some of these states and how this works with the extension. Uh, it is under the extensions menu, again, showing some of these additive filters here. Uh, I don't have all of the states in place. So this is really only showing one or two results. Uh, for every single thing, I've made a, a dummy graph, a mock-up graph to showcase some of this. But it does start to paint the picture of how you can sort of very quickly navigate around your graph and understand uh, sort of all of the, the states that are at play, uh, all of the information, and, and make changes should you wish. Yeah. So last Thursday morning, Sol, when Helena showed me that um, quick click to go to the node, which is providing the warnings or the errors, etc. 
there goes half of my um, troubleshooting time right out the window right there. I was just like, I was <laughs> nice. ecstatic. Brilliant. Yeah. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Yeah. We, uh, and thank you so much for providing feedback on that, Ewan. We really appreciate it. So, um, it's, it helps a lot with framing what we do and how we get to the right kind of result. Um, so I just slipped back two slides because there is a, a pause here for any questions on anything you've seen so far or any additional questions uh, on the visual refresh because that is covering almost everything on the visual refresh. I realize I forgot a slide on zoom states. Uh, so you can imagine that when you zoom out past a certain threshold, uh, the nodes are going to recolor themselves to either red, blue or yellow if they're in those states and they're going to have those icons show much bigger in them. So when you want to zoom out, you very quickly get like this macro view of what your graph is doing. Um, but I want to pause here for a hot second to see if there's any any questions on any of the visual refresh stuff, uh, which is sort of the end of the, the first portion. And I do realize we have, we have a half an hour left, and so I probably need to speed up in the next bit. Cool. All right. So keep firing away with any questions you guys might have. Um, we're going to quickly go through like what's in the pipes in Dynamo. Um, given that we've got half an hour left and there's three different or two different uh, presentations left out of the three, might have been a little bit ambitious and bought a bit, a bit enough for the back and chew. How are we going to have a sneak peek at what's coming uh, down the pipes? The work that's underway right now and planned. So we're working right now on this thing called a notification center. So previously you have uh, the ability to see like uh, system file load exceptions in Dynamo today. Uh, we're looking to sort of consolidate that and also do a, a push system that will be able to spread messages to the whole Dynamo ecosystem. So this is things like uh, blog posts have come out or any fixes that may be salient for you to see. Uh, so instead of you having to sort of manually you know, keep an eye on something yourself, you'll be able to see this in product as well. And in the future, we're looking to expand this into a world where different offices get the ability to send messages to their own people. But in the short term, uh, this is going to be focused on us, the Dynamo team, sending messages to the whole Dynamo community. We're also looking to bring authentication into Dynamo Core. Uh, so right now, Dynamo is authenticated in uh, the world of Civil 3D and Revit, and that's it. Uh, what that means is you have access to the package manager, the ability to actually upload to the package manager. So we want to bring authentication into the Dynamo Core experience. So every single host, like Robot Structural Analysis, with Bart Steel, and so on, gets the ability to also publish packages to the package manager, but also sets us up for the future of a more deeper, richer connection to the broader Autodesk ecosystem. So if you're thinking about things like Forge, you're thinking about uh, things like analysis routines, you're thinking about things like SpaceMaker, like this is going to help us start to connect into those ecosystems. And it's a pretty exciting uh, foundational aspect uh, to what the future may bring. We're also looking to empower uh, Node Autocomplete, which is a feature that enables you to sort of build graphs uh, with machine learning. And so right now you have an object type approach, which just simply says if you're clicking on a geometrical input, any node that can create geometry is going to be surfaced there and like a list that's better than the current experience of trying to search through a library of 700 plus nodes uh, and the matrix of crazy um, sort of connections you can make there. Uh, but the, the ML recommendation system is going to use real graphs from real people and understand the context of your graph to make a recommendation uh, that is the most relevant as opposed to only matching on an object type approach. Suffice it to say that this feature, once we get it done, we project should very dramatically improve the way that you build graphs and help people in particular who are new to the world of Dynamo learn from the broader Dynamo community. So we're going to have a series of graphs that we're going to feed into it uh, that are sort of given by the broader community with permission that is going to help sort of facilitate this model and, and build better graphs faster. So we're pretty excited for this. Uh, theoretically could dramatically over, reduce the overhead of uh, what you need to know to be able to be successful with Dynamo. We're also looking at deploying Dynamo settings. So here you go, Yuan. Uh, we're in the next, we work on a quarterly basis at Autodesk, so it's every three months we sort of plan work. Uh, next quarter, we're planning on uh, working through deploying Dynamo settings. And so all of that good stuff that we saw in the visual refresh around settings and things, uh, Yuan rightly pointed out that what if you have an office with lots of different people? Uh, oh, it was an all. Oh, sorry, sorry, but, Anton. Uh, I share um, the same vein. <laughs> so, sorry, Anton, my bad. Uh, yeah, so what if you have an office of lots of different people? We really want to make this uh, you know, an enjoyable experience for you too. And, and so this is uh, empowering, in particular, larger offices, but hopefully everybody, uh, to be able to have a predefined set of uh, settings, and you'll be able to bundle those into the installer. So if you think of the way you can create a custom install today with Revit, and you can have your INI file be bundled into that, 
uh, the Dynamo settings are going to be part of that as well. So we're going to bundle that up, have that as part of the same experience, and also express more settings to be part of that settings file, so you can have more consistency across the board. I am sorry, the sorry, player sorry player player. Uh, yes, including the Dynamo player. So uh, we're working closely with the team who's responsible for that, and uh, it's going to be in the, the same settings file. So actually, Dynamo player settings and Dynamo settings are going to become the same thing as we move on. Sounds fantastic. Then, yeah, we're pretty excited. Uh, there, we're also integrating this thing called the customer error report system. All you need to know on this front is that currently when things crash, sometimes uh, the information that's given to us by Dynamo is not very useful, not very actionable. Uh, this system should give us more useful, actionable information and also help you to provide more information uh, to, to help us resolve any sense to try and make Dynamo more stable. It's this thing called a MTBF or mean time between failure, which means how long can the program be open before it crashes? And that number should be pretty high. In the case of Revit, this is like days and days, if not months. That's really, really good. And the times Dynamo, I think we peaked at about 16 and a half hours. So we need to do better and this should help us get there. Uh, we're also doing a massive set of work on the Dynamo VM refactor. So this is like the virtual machine, the, the engine that executes the code that you have in your graph. Uh, and we're looking to, in essence, replace the custom bespoke design script virtual machine uh, that's been in Dynamo for forever uh, with the, an MSIL, so it's a baseline Microsoft uh, virtual machine. And that's going to remove a series of different layers and all that you really need to know is that's going to make Dynamo quicker. Cut, so early days and uh, you know, caveat this with, we don't know what it's going to be like yet once we do the real work, but some very hack and slash methods are showing about a 50% speed increase across the board. Uh, and even more importantly, a reduction in overhead costs of Dynamo, which means that depending on the graph you make, uh, it's going to be potentially way faster than that too. So the the uh, the cost, the performance cost on Dynamo after, after we do this work should predominantly be on how you build your graph. And the latter half of this presentation is going to cover some, some rules on that front. I'm pretty excited about this. This is going to be uh, potentially multi, definitely multi-quarter, potentially multi-year project to, to get this right, but it's going to be pretty good. Uh, this is setting uh, the future for uh, Dynamo being shipped uh, sort of into the cloud space too. It needs to be fast enough to be able to make sure that you can send information, get it executed and returned back in a reasonable time frame for it to be useful. And then we're also consuming uh, new polycurves. So if you've used polycurves inside of Dynamo, you'll notice there's some mm, weirdity, weird oddities, some jankiness and so on with the behavior. Uh, we have worked closely with the, the, one of the geometry teams inside of Autodesk, uh, which we use for our geometry kernel, and they're introducing new polycurve uh, native functionality, which is going to be much more performant and also sort of much more responsive and much more accurate too. So this we're looking probably to release in uh, global launch, which is the, the big major releases every year uh, for the upcoming year. Pretty excited about this as well. So really important workflows uh, that rely on polycurves today are going to become more and more trustworthy and it's going to open up new realms of possibility in this space too. So rattling through it at rocket speed, uh, any questions on any of the future stuff? Cool. Oops, wrong way. All right, we got the final, the final of the three presentations. Uh, so we'll try and get through this. Uh, so and... just, just sorry, sorry, just, just one sure. quick question uh, regarding that, no that part because it's a, it's a obvious, obviously a very important one because we, uh, you, you touched some, so many points around, you know, the improvements and uh, future developments and so on. Uh, what are, in your opinion, uh, the main, still the main pain points uh, of Dynamo? I know that it's a it's a tricky question. Obviously, it depends on how you use Dynamo and so on. But yeah, we we all know, you know, that Dynamo is one of the solutions that we can use. Okay, now now with Rhino yeah. inside Revit, you can use, you know, uh, Grasshopper or or you can, you know, there's a there's a larger base now of. Uh, uh, I would say uh, new programmers. I'm calling this way. You know, the people without you know maybe background in programming, but now they they are able you know to develop, for example, Revit Revit scripts or Revit macros or, mm -hmm. or you know or or Revit addins. You know, uh, because of the uh, amazing, for example, work that has been done you know with forums and and other communities like ours around. Um, so, mm -hmm. what are in your opinion wh where Dynamo is still you know. Uh, has still some, let's say, gaps if you consider, like I say, other packages yeah. or other tools or or even, you know, uh, um, low-level programming. Right. 
uh, I, I should answer, we've got lots of gaps. We're trying to improve many different things, but uh, I think performance is really, really a big bucket. So, you know, we want you, we, we spent like the last year and a half working on the visual refresh stuff to be able to make the, you know, information at your fingertips to make that experience, the authoring experience better. Uh, there is also the execution experience, which performance plays a big role in. And we're really excited about the possibility of what this means. You know, we could, we're talking about like massive improvements to the, the ability to use, uh, you know, use Dynamo. Time is money at the end of the day, and we're giving you back time is really important. So we see that as being hugely impactful. Um, a lot of the other pieces are sort of really setting up a future state, if you can read between the lines, of getting Dynamo into more places and connecting to the cloud ecosystem. So we're looking at Dynamo's evolution into that space. Uh, there's some foundational pieces that are required to make that a success, and that is things like making performance, uh, so making it fast and snappy enough to be able to send and receive data and execute that in reasonable timeframes. Um, so pretty excited predominantly on the performance front as it stands right now. Uh, the deployment is also a big problem. Uh, it is rightly noted by Anton, uh, you know, the ability to have like the same kind of common experience for every single user uh, to be able to trust and rely on certain workflows is really important. So like dependency conflicts, deployment and performance are kind of the three, three big uh, hurdles uh, as it stands right now, now that we've at least touch wood resolved a lot of the issues with people be able to understand the program they're working in and have that information at their fingertips. Sorry, I just have another question as well, just when Perfect. you're touching on the sure. authoring experience there. Um, one of the big things that, like, that, that looks great. All of this stuff is amazing for the authoring experience, by the way. I think it's going to be really good. Um, awesome. But one of them is the search function, and I've always yeah. had a tough time trying to tell people, like, you type in the keywords of what you want to know, but Sometimes you'll put a dot in front of it. Sometimes you won't have the spaces and sometimes like right. you, there's a lot of conditions around when you're trying to find these things and that's just time yeah. to learn that. But Agreed. trying to ease that pain for the new people, is there, is there any plan there? So we, yes, uh, in a <laughs> different way. So, so short answer is like the search also wasn't so good performance wise. So we've improved mm -hmm. that. So Dynamo 2, uh, 13, uh, and 215, I think I've had work on top search. So that should be snappier, uh, first of all, once you get into that world. Uh, secondarily, the node autocomplete stuff that we're doing is kind of like a parallel way to get into that world and get people up to speed faster. Um, so once we empower it with machine learning, we expect that to be a sort of more effective entry point, especially for new users, than it is to use search. Uh, search obviously is still really important. Um, we do have plans to improve search. It's a little bit tricky because you start making trade-offs when you when you make some of these choices. And so there's a, you know, a little bit damned if you do, damned if you don't, no matter which way you sort of skin it. Um, you know, people who are used to having it like uh, like hard typing the exact terms on things, find a, there's one method that's faster to do that. And then people mm -hmm. who are sort of more exploratory, trying to find sort of terms and tags related to certain things, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's there's a different way to do that. And you have to optimize kind of for one or the other. Um, mm -hmm. So we are looking to try and improve across the board for sure. Um, but also doing these tangential plays to try and get uh, sort of machine learning to empower graph building. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. No worries. Cool. So I think we've got what about 20 minutes left. Let's see how we can go. Uh, the last piece is it called uh, how to make Dynamo sing. And this is going to be in the old UI because I didn't get a chance to update it. Um, but it is all relevant when it comes to uh, the actual information. So this is around like saving resources and getting the most out of uh, Dynamo's performance. So what takes resources in Dynamo? There's these six sort of major buckets that take in uh, resources. Uh, UI loadup, node execution, tessellation, rendering, marshalling, and compilation. And some of those words might not make sense to you. Uh, but the things that you can affect are the things in Salmon. So node execution is how long it takes each node to run. Uh, tessellation is breaking up surfaces into polygons. Uh, and then rendering is drawing uh, things in the background preview. So there's certain settings you can choose in Dynamo to sort of make that faster. The other three things are on us, and the other three things are the ones we were looking at at this giant performance narrative that we're doing right now. So rendering precision. So note, caveat, this is all now in the preferences panel, but you can choose to uh, express yourself through there, and they're all very findable. So first of all, the graph will simply uh, run faster, in essence, render faster with lower precision. So if you don't care about the way it looks to the perfect sort of graphical uh, presentation quality, uh, we'd recommend that you run it at a lower precision. That's actually going to save you time, especially if you have more and more things you want to render in the background. Uh, so depending on your own OCD levels, I, you know, I like things looking nice. Sometimes I just 
suck it up and, and take the longer rendering times, you can uh, lower it down and have that actually run faster. And then just bump it back up when you want to potentially take a screenshot and make a presentation from Dynamo. You also have the ability to uh, play with preview bubbles. And so to, to take sort of like a, a step backwards, like everything on a computer takes resources, right? So we're talking about like drawing things on the computer versus executing things through the VM, like they all take uh, resources. So in the case of uh, like memory, you know, rendering takes quite a lot of memory, some things are held in memory in terms of nodes and so on. Uh, the ability to turn off things that you don't need to see in the graph, in this case, preview bubbles, is actually gonna speed up the performance as well. So now uh, if you turn off the preview bubbles in mass, like this in this button, it's gonna uh, sort of improve, especially larger graphs or heavy graphs. You can turn that off uh, faster run times. You can also just not have those preview bubbles sort of rendering uh, on the nodes themselves, but this actually stops Dynamo even considering a preview bubble uh, when you want to use it. We also have this notion of the geometry working range. Uh, it's not really a uh, performance, it's a little bit performance related, but it, in essence controls like the decimal place on these numbers. It has uh, some ramifications towards the accuracy of information. There are some minute rounding errors that may crop up in here, but if it is surfacing a warning, uh, it is essentially the VM trying to uh, trying to make sense of uh, something that it doesn't think is right. So this has a cost associated with it as well. Uh, short answer here is try and work in the, the most appropriate one for you. If you work in the world of civil 3D, a medium is the one that works best uh, because of those rounding errors across a very large scale, uh, uh, so kilometers of, of application. Whereas if you're working in a building scale, typically you're not gonna get the same rounding problems. Uh, so if you are working in sort of city scale stuff, I suggest working in uh, meters or feet uh, as opposed to millimeters. The geometry preview as well. So if you turn off the geometry preview, that simply means that Dynamo doesn't have to render that stuff in the background. If it doesn't have to render it, it's not using resources to do that. Uh, so would recommend if you don't need to see stuff uh, to turn off the background preview of a bunch of different things. That's simply gonna uh, save you resources, both from the memory perspective from the time perspective for rendering. Super quick question on that one, Sol. So sure. if it's not rendered in the background preview, is it still stored in the rendering memory? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, okay, so, cool. it, they so you're going to hold on to complex uh, geometry and you just turn it all off. <laughs> well, the tessellation is different. Um, yeah. So rendering in terms of drawing, yes, I don't think that's saved. The tessellation is saved per node and we'll get to that in a second. Awesome. So uh, showing labels as well, you know, if you want to see labels, that actually adds significant cost uh, to the performance as well, especially if it's lots of them. So suggest not using those if you're concerned about uh, time. Um, you know, definitely use them if you're trying to navigate that geometry and understand sort of where that comes through. Uh, you can use both the right click show labels option, or you can just select something in your in your preview bubble, and that's going to give you that number of that piece. So, you know, again, recurring theme, uh, the less stuff Dynamo has to think about and draw, uh, the faster it's going to be. Uh, in terms of freezing nodes, again, this is also going to help. So if you freeze a node, uh, any node that you freeze and downstream nodes are going to be frozen. This simply tells the VM to ignore them, so it's going to execute faster. So it's going to execute up until that point that the graph is frozen. Uh, graphically, that's going to gray out the nodes or in, in the newer versions, uh, change it to blue actually, uh, like a blue overlay with a freeze icon. Uh, and this enables you to, in essence, turn up pieces of your graph. There is also where you work and so dynamo inside a rivet or civil 3d is what we call in process which means it's part of the application living in the same memory space which means that it will lock up your application and you will not be able to do anything as soon as you click around and you have to wait as you're probably all familiar uh, if you use dynamo sandbox or any of our outer process applications like informant or rubber structural analysis there is separate threading uh, for both the engine and the UI. So you can be executing something while you're still interacting with the UI, like creating groups, placing notes, renaming nodes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you can sort of clean up your graph while you're waiting for it to execute. So it saves a little bit of time there. And if you're curious about Dynamo Sandbox, you can download it from dynamobuilds.com uh, and it gives you an essence, like a zipped folder. It's not gonna touch your registry, not gonna make any changes to your graph, uh, sorry, to your computer. Uh, you can put it on a zip drive if you want and just take it with you. It's sort of fully self-contained. contains everything it needs to make Dynamo run. The caveat is that if you're trying to use it with Revit, it's a little difficult because it doesn't, it's not inside of the memory space, which means it doesn't have access to anything Revit. You can play a few tricks with uh, generative design packages to get information um, from the data remember node back and forth. But uh, generally speaking, 
Dynamo would be most useful inside of the Revit experience if you use it inside of Revit. I use Sandbox a lot myself because I typically play with geometry. Uh, in terms of no preview, uh, we sort of touched upon this a little bit above, uh, but in essence, there's one tactic you can use with this, which is like using a, a code block as like a show me stuff kind of node. And uh, you just move that around the graph, have everything turned off by default and just see stuff that you want to see. It simply passes the information through. It's kind of like a pass through node or a, uh, yeah, pass through node. Only rendering one set of geometry, saving you time. Uh, in terms of not so much saving time, but power, uh, blue, Boolean operations are incredibly powerful things, but they are costly. So try and avoid doing them if you don't need them. Um, if you do need them, sort of Booleaning the element first, if you've got repetitious elements and then translating it is much faster than trying to sort of create uh, a bunch of different elements and then Boolean all of those elements at once. So creation events are slower than moving events. So translating of geometry is much, much, much faster, less costly than it is to create stuff. So if you want to have, say, 100 different boxes that are filleted and then they're billioned into something else, uh, do it once and then replicate that across those spaces. It'll be much faster. And um, what's really interesting, though, is the like the comparative to some of our competitors, uh, booleans are really powerful inside of Dynamo and they're much harder to do in other places. And you can do sort of uh, solid unions or joining geometry that's not touching as well. So you'll notice in this, uh, this example on the right hand side, uh, all of those different uh, boxes that are individually created are then union together into a single element. The cool thing about that is you can use that single element as say a cutting tool, and that's going to be faster than trying to sort of loop through a bunch of different elements to do cutting operations. Uh, so there's some tricks you can play to, to get faster on that front too. But again, uh, trying to construct geometry for uh, or translate geometry rather than booleaning many different things is much faster performance-wise. Tessellation, uh, as we touched upon, is the, the act of sort of converting geometry into triangles in essence. Uh, and it's much, much quicker to create geometry than it is to tessellate stuff. So it's kind of like the drawing aspect of, of the geometry uh, and removing the tessellation events can actually speed up your graph quite a lot. So uh, geometry nodes inside of Dynamo always tessellated. The reason for that is that's kind of the point of Dynamo. It's inspectable at every stage. You get to see at every single node, you get to turn this preview on and off and you get to see the, the information coming through from the preview bubble. Uh, that inspectability does come at a cost of performance. And if you want to get around that, you can use zero touch nodes, uh, which are C-sharp based or Python nodes to, in essence, only return the result you want. So if you want to use a Python node to take in a bunch of different geometry, do a whole bunch of different things to it, and then only return the result, you can dispose of that geometry inside of that node and it's never going to get tessellated and therefore it's going to be much faster. Uh, was there, was there a question? The yeah, that, that just position of the geometry there, so with the garbage collection, was the yes. later versions of Dynamo, they do that, does that autom automatically, we don't need to manually dispose of geometry inside of Python or do we? Yeah, correct. So you should be able to, should auto dispose. Like theoretically, uh, if you do manually dispose stuff, it may in some cases be better because the garbage collector gets called at certain uh, intervals. But yes, uh, you can avoid that if you don't want to do it. So in essence, yeah, if you want to have the fastest, snappiest graph possible that is using geometry, I uh, suggest uh, indexing into Python or C sharp nodes to do some of the, the heavy lifting. Um, then moving on to host geometry, you can also leverage the power of the host. In this case, say Rivet. Rivet is very good at instancing, so use it to do instancing. Uh, you can use Dynamo as the placing mechanism or the, the rig or the recipe, and you can use uh, Revit to, to actually place elements. Uh, and also interacting with the Revit API is going to be faster if you use native Revit API calls, uh, and that's because there's uh, less translation that's needed between different things. So for example, like a, a Revit db.xyz is going to be faster than a Dynamo point converted to a yeah, in the XYZ inside of Revit. Uh, there is also, uh, if you start to see slowness over time when you're trying to do lots of geometrical operations, uh, there may be a memory leak in what you're trying to do. We have done a huge amount of work over the course of the last seven or eight different releases to rem remove that. It should be in a pretty good state, but there may be some cases that snap through. Uh, if that's the case, if you notice things slowing down, we suggest to, to restart uh, if you can. Noting that some projects take ages to open and, and some people like to keep their machine on uh, a long time. I personally, when I was working in practice, would restart every day uh, at least once. Uh, and if you can't handle that, then maybe at least once a week uh, would help you. Uh, other programs also have memory leaks, not just Dynamo. So uh, over the course of, of time, you may run into the memory problem. 
And then in terms of geometrical power, uh, Booleans are again, very powerful. Uh, so they do really cool things. So don't write them off as being performance costly because uh, that trade-off does come with some, some really cool sort of operations. So you can Boolean really complex solids by Booleaning things that have already been Booleaned and do that sort of ad infinitum. Uh, you can get some really interesting shapes in that way. And then in terms of memory use, try to, to think about using abstract stuff as much as possible. Uh, you know, re you again, restart your machine, uh, but use mathematical operations uh, or textual based operations as much as you can in lieu of geometrical ones. They're going to be much, much faster. The machine can actually process that thing in much less time. Uh, and also don't use solids or meshes until you need to, but if you have to use them, meshes are much lighter than solids. So that will get you there faster. So something like Mesh Toolkit is a really good tool to, to lean into. And again, you can use uh, zero touch or, or Python based nodes to avoid that space. And then uh, in the Dynamo Primer, there's this data type hierarchy uh, image. And if you lean as much as you can at the abstract types, it's always faster in pretty much every single instance than it is using geometrical types. So things like vectors, bounding boxes, topologies are going to be faster than points, curves, surfaces, and solids. And then uh, in terms of topology versus geometry, to get a little bit deeper into that, so non-manifold geometry is typically faster than manifold. That basically means like pseudo geometry is faster than real geometry uh, and it is a sort of topology is like a lightweight geometrical representation uh, and certain packages leverage topology so things like the vasa package uh, which is like a 3d uh, voxelation package which you see in a lot of right uh, or dynamic shape from long uh, win or the topologic package they all use uh, a form of topology uh, to do their stuff and you notice they're quite snappy inside of the world of dynamo but to convert them into dynamo things you have to use specific nodes to do that. And that's where the cost is incurred. Uh, these represent things like faces, edges, vertex, wires, shells, and so on. But lean into these if you're doing complex geometry stuff in a particular shout out to the VASA package, which enables you to do really cool things like line of sight and uh, shadow analysis and three-dimensional sort of path of travel and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then one thing to think about with performance, uh, with one or two caveats, uh, is TuneUp, which is an extension that we released on the package manager. This enables you to understand uh, how long every single node takes to execute uh, and then also give you an overall graph execution time. Uh, this means that you can do what we call profiling on your graph uh, and that gives you uh, insight into where you may want to optimize your graph. So maybe you will see a certain piece of your graph being really, really slow. And so you can think about how you can either use abstract geometry there or get to that same kind of result in a smarter way. Uh, it also allows for this thing called forced recomputation of the graph. Uh, Dynamo uses this uh, thing called uh, delta compute, which means it's not going to re-execute nodes unless it has to. Uh, and that saves you time. It's a performance uh, feature, but it also potentially comes at the cost of uh, you wanting to sort of force refresh those nodes, like Python nodes, uh, for example, randomization nodes and so on. You want to force refresh to, to get a different result. Uh, this is available in the package manager. Uh, and then we have future plans to integrate this into Dynamo out of the box, uh, but we haven't quite got there yet as well. Uh, there is a, a caveat. There is some, ironically, some performance concerns with TuneUp. Uh, so do let us know if you run into any of those. And if you are willing to share like a test graph that showcases that, that's even better because we can resolve those things faster. So that is, I think we're five minutes to spare. I've got three or four slides left after this one, but does anyone have any questions on performance stuff? I know it was a bit of a, a fire hose. And if not, uh, the takeaway is there's actually quite a lot you can do to optimize your usage of Dynamo as it stands right now. And then we are doing a lot to try and improve uh, the situation ourselves and, and mean that you don't have to do these optimizations as much in the future. Another uh, small comment from my side. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's almost overwhelming, you know, the quantity of information <laughs> you gave us. Uh, and uh, it's, I had high expectations, but you honestly, you, 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 you went above and beyond. Uh, so thank you very much, really. Uh, lots, lots of stuff to, to go through. I think uh, we all need to or, uh, go through this presentation a couple of times to appreciate all the all the details. Um, in terms of performance, um, I believe, uh, yeah, those are those are very 
uh, in programming language, we will say low level. So you 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 went into yeah. the details, okay, on how things go. Uh, there are overarching considerations that I think are general and always valid. Whatever uh, programming language you you select or whatever uh, programming right. approach you you select, that are uh, using the right packages is one of the one of the most important thing. The, the performance is you know the packages are not equal in terms of performance. They can achieve the same result using different techniques and, and different somehow also uh, programming approach and so on. So uh, this is really this is really important and this I think this tune up is is really fundamental to understand the differences between them. Uh, starting, uh, for example, uh, you you can you can somehow benchmark your 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 simple scripts. You can create a simple scripts, and then you can uh, if you have a different nodes achieving somehow the the you know the same result, you can test you know uh, exchanging those and and making some informed decisions up front. Uh, before your graph is becoming too complex then to understand the single impact of factors and, and you know, and situations and so on. So I think this is a, a very powerful, very powerful tool, honestly, and a fundamental one. Uh, I think that we all went or we all were there when you start small and you think, yeah, this is going to work. This is, uh, I, uh, I need to apply this for this graph to, to, a, to a project, for example, if you're talking about Revit, a model or whatever it is, and, and it works, it works well in that situation. Then the problem is how this graph then uh, is resilient and is able to, to, to scale properly when the, you know, the target of, of the operation or the subject, let's, let's call it like we want, the object, you know, if we are talking about object oriented uh, uh, somehow approach, uh, how they scale when things get complex. And then this makes a lot of difference between developing something maybe slower at the beginning, doing your stuff, your tests and so on, but then you can apply the same script in, in more, hopefully all, but let's say more uh, situations. Uh, rather than finding yourself, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, the process actually being too slow, for example, in certain situations because of the geometry or the, you know, uh, or, you know, or, or even crashing, you know, because this, this can happen. So thank you very much. Yeah. I think that, that uh, it's, it's really, it's really nice to see those, you know, some of those uh, behind the scenes, you know, optimizations that we can, that we can really um, leverage. Um, um, I don't have any other questions. I uh, I think we run out of time. Just spot on. Uh, again, I yeah. believe that you really delivered a lot of uh, important and, and information. I, I I give you yeah just space for a recap. I see you on the screen, and yeah. uh, I want I, to I thank you quickly. again. <laughs> thank you again, and thank you all the the audience for joining us. Awesome. Thank you, Amadeus. So just very quickly, two last slides. So just a content recap. We explored the visual refresh. In essence, uh, modernizing how Dynamo looks, feels, and how uh, we introduced a bunch of new authoring tools. We explored what's coming uh, next in the world of Dynamo, which is around preparing Dynamo's evolution into the cloud uh, and exploring rich connections into the broad Autodesk SaaS ecosystem. And we realized that optimizing Dynamo is easier than you think with a bunch of different ways to go about it, uh, exploring what you can do yourself to improve the performance of your graphs. And then just for the sake of the video, uh, here is a couple of different learn more resources if you want to see them. There is the Dynamo Primer has been updated. If you just do primer2.dynamobim.org, you'll get to see the visually refreshed primer. We've also refreshed the videos. I'm not going to read out the URL. Uh, and we have uh, Dynamo Office Hours, which is a series that myself and Jacob Small do with a bunch of different special guests on all things Dynamo. We currently have about 32 different one hour long sessions. So there should be something in there to tickle your fancy. Please go and have a look and tell us what you think. And that's it. Without further ado, Thank you so much, Emma for inviting me here. I hope you all learned something and it was a pleasure to present to my home country. <laughs>